What makes us tick? What gets your attention? What pulls it away? What pulls you out of your everyday reality, the demands, the patterns, the habits, and makes you connect to something outside of yourself, something bigger, something different, maybe something new? The question of attention. How does it really work? How do we get attention on the things that matter to us most? It's a question that's captured my attention for as long as I can remember. If my parents were in this room, they would be laughing, and they would tell you that I'm a real-life middle child, always wanting more attention, trying valiantly to get it, and terrified I just might. No surprise that for a while, I thought I wanted to be an actor. There, I had to learn not just how to get attention, but how to hold it with a room full of eyeballs focused on me, or not really me, but the character I was playing, which I'll tell you feels a lot different than this. I certainly learned something about attention in my work on Capitol Hill, how you get it, how you use it, how you earn it. There I saw equally important issues get ignored or get ignited because of it. Today, and on as many mornings as I can muster, I am a student of attention here on my yoga mat, where I explore what happens in my body and my mind when I tune in and focus on nothing or on everything, depending how you look at it. The truth is, I've built a life engaging with this question of attention, how we get it, and how we use it to create what's next. Most recently, for the last six years, I've been working with that question inside Viacom, a company built on the economy of attention. After all, our businesses live and die by our ability to get the attention of our audiences and lend it to our marketing and advertising partners. Um, you know, in 160 countries around the world, if we lose their attention, we lose. Second by second, we're getting measured. They're tuning in or tuning us out. Minute by minute, we're getting rated. Weekend by weekend at the box office, we're getting feedback. We're awash in data about what's hitting and what's not. And our jobs become to sort through what it all means, what they're trying to show us, where their attention really is going. Pretty quickly, when you're looking at attention, you bump into these guys, the millennials. Now, of course, they've got my attention. I'm a cusper. I'm just about a year out of the millennial frame, straddling the line between millennials and Xers. But it's not just me. These guys are getting a lot of buzz. Buzz because they're different, more likely to love their phone than their car, probably best friends with their parents, almost definitely driving you nuts at work. <laughs> they're getting buzz because they're huge. They're a third of humanity, the largest generational cohort the world has ever seen going to be 50% of the workforce by the year 2020. They're enormous, and they're making their presence felt because they're the masters of attention, even if it doesn't look like what you thought. They're the masters of getting it, of galvanizing it, of using it to challenge the institutions and governments and companies that serve us all to be better, to be more closely aligned to what we all need and what we all want in the world. They're really focusing us all to create what's next. How'd they get this way? Well, let's start with how they were raised, right at the center of attention. Their parents put them right in the middle of the family, with parents orbiting around them, celebrating their every move, giving them a trophy for coming in 11th place. <laughs> they've had their support, and they've had, I mean, every single moment of their lives documented by their own personal mama and paparazzi. Moments big and moments small. They've had their opinions so valued at home, they couldn't help but expect the world to receive them this way. So when they show up at work, we inherit that. They're demanding our attention, more of it, in different kinds than previous generations. They know they've got an impact to make on the world. They're going to make their mark felt. But they're looking for how to do it. They're looking around saying, you know, the means of production have been democratized. I know I can do this thing. But what's it going to be? They're not fighting the power. They are the power. But it's tough out there. They're coming of age at a time when they're the most educated, but most indebted, most underemployed generation in history. So they're looking to each other to help out. 
collaborating, tapping the wisdom of the crowd at a pace and scale the world has never seen. They're doing all of that at the speed of today, or even tomorrow, calibrating their cadence, more aware than any of us that the time between a success, a failure, and redemption is shorter than ever. They really are focusing us all to create what's next. Don't believe me? Take Malala, widely known as the most famous teenager in the world. At 16, she's already survived an assassination attempt, been the youngest nominee ever for a Nobel Peace Prize. The UN's even named a day after her. She's captured incredible attention globally, and for good reason. She was shot in the head for wanting to go to school and wanting other kids to be able to do the same. The thing is, though, what is she doing with the wealth of attention that's been paid her? She's channeling it to an issue she cares about more than any other, education for every girl and every boy in the world. Pretty brave in her circumstances, but not uncharacteristic of her generation. After all, she's from a generation of people who are writing the code, who are reshaping the system, reshaping the institutions and structures surrounding us, saying it doesn't have to be this way. When I was in college, I studied in a program called Symbolic Systems. It's a program I'll be explaining the rest of my life. Um, it's an interdisciplinary program in computer science, philosophy, psychology, and linguistics. It basically starts with the idea that our minds and our computers are both systems. They both use sets of symbols to represent knowledge, information, to communicate, and to really create meaning. I learned there that we are creating the code and really building the systems from the ground up in all kinds of ways, seen and unseen, determining the pathways, the trade-offs, the outcomes, in all sorts of ways. I also learned just how much attention you've got to pay, down to every last detail. Because one forgotten semicolon, well, that can be the difference between a runaway hit and total failure. I look at what people from this generation are doing, and I think, goodness, they know something intuitively that it took me years and years to figure out. That, that you can write the system from the ground up. I mean, heck, my interest in systems brought me to law school, where I found in the law um, a system that structures our interactions as individuals, as organizations, as societies. It took me years and exploration of different career paths to figure it out what is just coded in the DNA of this generation, that you can create it any way you want. Take Alexa Van Tobel. In financial services, she's saying, it doesn't have to be this way. I'm going to make something better. She paid attention. She realized that most of the industry is overlooking 99% of the people, most of the industry geared toward the elite. She also said, I, it doesn't need to be this way, that financial planning should have the aesthetics, the experience that can really resonate and connect with us. Why should it be blue? Why should it be that they all look the same? Why should it be that they look boring? She's using the code to change the system and do something different in financial services. Let's take another example near and dear to my heart from the city of Detroit, named Detroit Soup. It's a micro-granting dinner that celebrates um, the best ideas in that city about how to remake Detroit. Here's how it works. For $5, you show up, you get a bowl of soup, and you get to watch an evening of presentations about the best ideas for how to fix the city. Everything from art to education, technology to urban agriculture and everything in between. At the end of the night, everyone votes, and the winner goes home with the money raised that evening to use toward their project. The only obligation is you have to come back to a future soup dinner to report on your progress. These founders have created a platform for those, those innovators to get attention. And they're using that platform to redefine the system of that city. They're focusing us all on what's next for Detroit. I think of what they're doing with this platform, what Alexa is doing with LearnVest, what Malala is doing, frankly, and it reminds me of something my mother has always said which is truth works. When the honest truth meets a great expression, well, that captures our attention. And often it keeps it. It's a lesson I definitely learned in my first job on Capitol Hill, right before I learned what an anthrax attack looks like, which is a uh, story for another day. Um, 
I was a newly minted ghostwriter for a senator. My job was to respond to the constituents of New Jersey who wrote letters to their senator. And first on my docket was the ever exciting topic of social security. Pretty tough. What was the systems geek going to write about this topic so arcane, so esoteric, so riddled with complex knowledge of the Congressional Budget Office? I thought, well, what am I going to do here? So what did I do? I Googled it, like any great student of the 21st century, for inspiration. And this is what I found. A letter that President, uh, pardon me, a speech that President Clinton had just given on the topic where he talked about our deepest values, the duties we owe to our parents, the duties we owe to each other when we're in different situations in life, the duties we owe to our grandchildren and children, how we can move forward as one America. He got out of the technical discussion about that policy and got into a level, a layer, that was so much deeper, universally true, and really just couldn't be argued with. Forget your politics. I look at that and I think, you know, to do something like that, you've got to get out of your own way. You've got to figure out where your audience is coming from, how their lives work, and figure out how to connect. In the voice of my mentor today, that's about getting behind them, not out in front of them betting on them, like your future depends on it. But let's be honest, sometimes attention doesn't have to be so serious. In fact, sometimes we desperately need it not to be. Take one of my recent favorite internet hits, <laughs> tiny hamsters eating tiny burritos. <laughs> from the shop, a gift really, from the shop Hello Denizen. Take a look. <laughs> Pushing 7 million views, this thing flew around the internet a few weeks ago. And I mean, it's been credited as demonstrating a deep knowledge of viral video, all sorts of very important and grave things, but honestly, who wouldn't want to watch that? Here's the thing. Whether it's channeling the attention that's been paid you, or writing the code to reshape the system, or recognizing that truth works, and connecting on a human and universal level, or just giving people a minute to laugh. These are the levers that millennials are pulling to get our attention and to use it to create what's next. Of course, we're always going to have our individual concerns and priorities, our patterns and habits and points of inspiration, and thank goodness for that. That's the stuff that drives us through our days. But it's these moments that capture our collective attention, where we come together. That's where real potential can be ignited. Maybe we used to come together around a perfect TV show or the social cause so flagrantly deserving our attention or a well-crafted speech, and sometimes we still do. But more and more today, more and more of us have the opportunity to be that catalyst, to capture that attention, and use it to make something happen in the world. So what are we going to do with that? When I'm looking for inspiration, I look to millennials out in the forefront showing us the way, focusing us all to create what's next. So in some ways, consider this a big wet thank you kiss to the generation. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>